morning, everyone. We have two passages of scripture this morning. The first one from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 30 through 39. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Our second passage comes to us from the 37th chapter of Psalm, verses 39 and 40. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. May God add blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Thanks, Mark. As uh, we begin to look at God's word together this morning, I want to invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come this first Sunday of February 2014, Sunday when we will celebrate communion together, Holy Spirit, I ask you to fall on this place like water on a dry ground. I pray that we would encounter your presence here, that you would speak to the depths of our hearts. God, I pray that you would be able to clear away anything uh, that might have challenged us this week, anything that might call to us that would kind of distract us from hearing from you. I pray that your message would get through to us and that we would respond. Meet us now, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is Super Bowl Sunday. Whether we admit it or not, in American culture, that's one of the biggest Sundays of the year, is it? Not? Yeah. It's one of them. I mean, they've been talking about it for months. Now, for the last week, it doesn't matter whether it's the Weather Channel to the uh, talk shows to the sports channels, everywhere, everybody's talking about the Super Bowl. Many of you may just watch that game tonight. You may have some snacks planned. I don't know. One of the things that's true, though, is this will be the biggest stage that these players have ever been on. And truth be told, maybe they might never make it back 
to this one thing that they have been striving for really all of their lives. And so what do the coaches do? They take them through a walkthrough. They try to organize their meals. They try to organize everything about them so that they can take advantage of this one opportunity that they have so that they could be a part of something great. And even as I've thought about these athletes, you know, they've eaten what's right. They've hydrated their bodies. They spend hours working out. They do everything they can to excel. And it brings me to this question. You and I, I can confidently say that I will never play in a Super Bowl, right? That's just a given. But I dare say that all of us are guided by our hopes and our dreams and the things that we really want. So I have to ask you at the beginning of this February month, just two months, just one month really, into 2014, what are you shooting for? What are your hopes and dreams? Did you ever know that God wants you to pour those out before him? I encourage you over the next few days, maybe a week, maybe a month, to some way, whether you're a writer or not, write down or uh, speak it into your phone or whatever it might be, tell God what your hopes and dreams are. Matthew chapter 6 says this, where your heart is or where your treasure is, there your heart is too. Well, we're going to look at a story today, a story about Elijah. I love what it says in James chapter 5, starting, I think, around in verse 15. This is what James says about Elijah. He was a man just like you and me. Now you would be tempted to think because he was a prophet, because he's one of the major figures in the Bible, maybe you've never even read his story before, but he seems so distant, so far away. So how would I ever reach to that level? Uh, I can't really identify with Elijah. I want you to hold on to that, that James chapter 5 says that he was a man just like us. With that in mind, let me set the stage for you. There are 850 prophets of Baal in this story. That means that they are worshiping an idol named Baal. They've led the people of God to worship this idol, and they've convince them through all of their conversations, through all of their uh, working, through all of that they've done, that they should bow down to this one. And here comes one ordinary person, like you and like me, Elijah, and he says, God told me to tell you that you're not putting your heart in the right place. And so, he sets up this contest. And I really want you to picture this in your minds. He says, I'll tell you what. You get all of your prophets. You get everybody. I'll give you the sacrifice. You choose the sacrifice that you want. You build the altar the way that you want. You put everything together. And I'll let you do everything you want. You guys can even go first. You don't have to respond to what I do. You don't have to go after me. How many of you have ever wanted to do that when you were a kid? Everybody wanted to go first, right? We say, you know what? I don't have to go first. You go first. You try everything you can think of. And you see if your God responds. Folks, I have to say to you that sure, we might not have a bail here. 
We might not have 850 prophets around us, but we have voices upon voices speaking to us. We may put our hope in our homes, in our work, in our uh, ability to achieve something, in our ability to rest in accomplishing a list. We may be even hoping that we can convince somebody. Have you ever felt like that? If I could just say the right thing, thing, I can convince them that I'm right. And they'll turn around their lives and they'll see and I can make this happen. And if I can just get this one thing to happen, then everything else will be great. You ever been there? I have to confess that it happens to me. If I could just get this car to move in front of me a little faster, you know, I might get there. If I could just sneak through that green light while it's still green. You fill in the blank. That's an easy example, but you get the point. We all think that way. And so Elijah tells him, you do whatever you need to do and do it as well as you can possibly do it. And we'll see what happens. And so they begin. It says, then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. I mean, they, they gave it their best shot. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. Here they are, pouring out their hearts, giving it all they've got, and nothing in return. You ever felt like that? So as there was no response, and they began to dance. They danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Now, I just, now just an aside, I, I have to tell you this. As your pastor, just to give you my, I kind of love this section of Scripture. You just got to know that. What Elijah says to them, I love the way he says this. All right, so he says, shout louder. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and maybe you have to awaken him. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Folks, we spend so much time on what we could call Trivial Pursuits. How many of you ever played that game? Trivial Pursuit. You know, and you try to get those little pieces of pie in your, in your piece as you answer all these different questions. Well, I dare say we give our energy, our, our valuable uh, resources, our uh, everything we can think of, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength to accomplish this certain fulfillment like them, it's almost like our blood flows, right? And yet, nothing happened. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. You see, we dance around the issue. We try so hard. We are right there with them. Yet nothing happens. And all I want to say to you is not to, to say, uh, to give you a hard time about that, but to say to each one of us, myself included, that we don't have to dance around anymore. We don't have to try to work really hard. Sure, our work matters. Our home matters. Our uh, finances matter. Our treasure matters. These things, God knows, in Matthew chapter 6, it says that God knows that we need them. But he gives us this encouragement. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, what you need, will be given to you. So I want to encourage you with that thought. As we begin to look at this. Elijah then in our passage picks up and he cries out to God one time. And he cries out and he says, God, answer me. Listen, he actually told them to pour water it says, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, 
He ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Okay, so we're getting to the point here where, remember, the, uh, in this contest of who is God, they want the sacrifice to be lit on fire. They want the sacrifice to be uh, burned up. And Elijah, through the whole thing, does what is not conventional. He puts all his eggs in one basket in God. I'm going to tell you, folks, if he doesn't, if God does not come through for Elijah, Elijah's going to look like a fool, amen? He's not only going to look like a fool, he's going to receive some pain. Because I'm going to tell you that the king of Israel does not like Elijah. And if Elijah is proved wrong, Ahab's going to have him for lunch. You understand? And so when he puts all of his eggs in one basket, he is really putting himself out there saying, God, if you don't come through for me, I am toast. You ever done that? You ever put yourself out there for God? You ever really said, you know, this is an opportunity, God, for me to put all of my eggs in one basket. And so just so you see, Elijah says, hey, guys, dump water on it once. I mean, really, four, fill four jars and dump it on there. And by the way, do it again and do it a third time. I'm telling you, this is drenched. So this is what the passage says. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things as you commanded. Let me ask you, what is the passion of your life? If somebody was to ask you, what is the one thing that you want to see others to see in you? What's the one thing you want to experience? What's the one thing that if I could only accomplish one thing, it could happen? You know what Elijah says? Let everybody around here, including myself, let me experience afresh that you are God and that I'm your servant. So as he prays this, he says, answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you are Lord God. You, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and all so licked up the water in the trench. Folks, God didn't just send a flicker. Didn't just light a match. God consumed everything. Could you imagine that? If God would consume my worries and my fear, and my concern, and the challenges I'm facing. What if God could consume when I go into the, into the hospital room, or I go into the boardroom? What if God could show His light to me and through me to a world that is watching? What if God could knock my socks off? You see, that's what God did that day, and here was their response. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And I want you to know something. Did you know that the name Elijah means Yahweh is God? That means the Lord is God. So do you know what they're crying? They're crying, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. One man against the whole host of everybody anybody could think of, anybody who could dance, anybody who could prostrate themselves, anybody who was anybody, he takes them on. And you know who wins? Not Elijah, but God. And you know who wins because God wins? Elijah. I have to ask you, have you noticed all of the potholes around our area. I have. Do you know how I found out about them? My tire has met probably each one along 30 as I, or, you know, as a, whatever this road is that goes out of East Canton to 30. Everyone, you ever see how many there are? Or over in, I've met them over in Louisville. 
I've met him in Alliance everywhere. And I also see this happening. Workers going along and they, they get this little tar stuff out and they, they mix it and they put it together and they dump it in the hole. And they, cut, they cover it over. And it, it looks nice, doesn't it? You know, and I'm thankful for it because at least for two days my tire won't go in the hole. But a week later, what's going to happen? Welcome to the crater of East Canton once again, right? Folks, what happens? They don't, they don't really fix the hole, do they? They just kind of bandage it up. And now, if anybody works for the road crew or you know anybody on the road crew, I'm really glad they bandage them up. I'm not giving them a hard time. I hope they keep doing it, but stay with me. Okay? They just bandage stuff up. And they don't really fix the hole that really exists down in there. They just kind of cover the thing up. And so a week, two weeks, a month later, what happens? There I am in the crater, and my tire is half busted, right? What about your life? You cover stuff up, right? You kind of get it. If I could just get enough money, if I could just get enough uh, love from this person, if I could just get enough from this, then I'll just cover that up, and I start to feel better. But eventually that begins to erode away. And you're left with a hole. But I want to encourage you with a couple of thoughts this week. That if we will put our trust in God, no matter where you're at, no matter where you are, in your work situation, in your kids' school situation, if you're concerned about their past, their present, or their future, no matter what it is, if you will put your faith in God like Elijah does, God will answer you. Now you have to understand, Elijah does everything that God tells him to the point that he, like I said, I went through that for a reason. Do you see he told him to pour water on it three times? This is like against all odds, right? And you may say, well, that's just a great Bible story. No, I'm saying to you that just like God worked in Elijah's life, God wants to work in your life. You may not be standing around 850 prophets, but you're standing right in the midst of your life, and God says, the word is not far from you, it is near to you. I have come that you might receive life and that you might have it abundantly. Yeah, I want you to know that when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you want to know something? I walk right with you. Do you know that the sin that so easily entangles you, I have already walked that road and I am here for you. I don't want to see you get stuck in pothole after pothole after pothole. No, I want to cleanse you from the inside. I want to make you new. I want you to experience me. I want you to be refreshed. And not only that, but did you see that Elijah wants the whole world to know? You ever want to see our church grow? You want to see your school succeed? You want to see things happen? Well, I want to encourage you that Elijah wanted to see not only himself, but the whole world know. And if you know Christ today, God wants to use you to make him known to somebody. Anybody. If you think somebody else can do it, God is saying, no, I've put you on the field because I love you and I care for you and I care for them. And I want you to go. I want to read this passage for you from Psalm 37. And then I've got to kind of wrap up so we can do communion together. It says this, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. I want to encourage you with this this morning. You see, salvation is about eternity. Yes, your name is written in the book of life. Your name is 
with Christ in God. You no longer have to fear death or this thing of death or sin or those things. But grace covers you. Grace is greater than all of your sin when you put your hope and your faith in Christ. And it is a future thing. But I want to encourage you that today in John chapter 17 and verse 3, it says this, that eternal life is that they may know you, Jesus, and the one who sent you, that is God. And the Holy Spirit, who is to be the comforter and the one who lives inside of you. You see, eternal life begins now. And God wants you to know the experience of his presence and his love. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, going through 33, it's Moses' last uh, last speech, really, to the people of Israel before he hands the mantle of leadership to Joshua and he's about to go and, and pass away and so he says this the word is not far from you it is near to you you need not say to someone go out there and get it for me and bring it to me so that I might know it but know the God who loves you the word that is for you is here you and near you and in you and so hear me folks hear me the God who died was buried and raised again on the third day is for you, is with you. And I am telling you right now that it doesn't matter how deep that crevice in your life goes or the next person that you see, God wants to meet that need. And here's where we'll end. I want to encourage you to do something for me. I want to encourage you to be moldable. You see, we, we often talk a lot about answering the call of God. But I began to realize something. I answer a lot of calls on my phone day after day. But you know, it's how I allow that call to shape my heart or change my direction. or make me take a different path that is going to determine my day. And I want to encourage you that God is not saying this to you. Go out and be my clay. You see, the Bible says in Isaiah that we are clay in the potter's hand. He's not saying, go out and dream big dreams for me. He's saying, let me dream through you. And I have to say to you, what is your vision for your life? God has a plan for your life. God has a passion for your life. And God has a way that you were made to go. And you know what God wants you to do? Is to know that plan. And the only way that you're going to know that plan is to love Him and to trust Him and to walk with Him because you'll never get there on your own. But there is one who has come to take you to that call. So I want you to think about clay this morning. And I want to ask you, how moldable are you? How willing are you to let go of your fears and concerns and to stand just like Elijah did and say, God, here I am. I'm your servant. I'm going to give you everything I have. If you'll do that, God will answer you. God will care for you. And God stands ready right where you are to make you new. So don't get stuck in the potholes of life. Let's pray. Lord God, as we come to the communion table this morning and we take the bread and the cup together, I pray for my friends who sit here God, that they would know your presence. That as they eat this bread and they drink of this cup, that they would feel your presence filling their current situation. Filling their heart. Giving them strength. Making them new. And I pray that they would know that there's no stone that's too small for you to turn over. And there's no boulder too big for you to move. God, I pray that they would meet with you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward for our communion.